silly game where you say two true statements about yourself and, and then one lie. And I have this little quirk about me that I always say for that game. And, um, it's that I've dislocated my jaw well over 20 times. Um, and most people think that's a lie, but it's actually true. I have a bizarre little joint in my jaw that instead of it looking like uh, a ball and socket, it looks like a horseshoe. So if I yawn, out comes the jaw. Um, and for the longest time, I didn't know how to put my own jaw back in, which is kind of important if you're going to dislocate it every time you yawn. And so I would go to the ER, and they would heavily medicate me, and, uh, and then they would send me home after they put my jaw back in place, and then they would send me bills, which at the age of 18, I, I promptly ignored because I had no clue how I was going to pay them. Um, and the uh, bills suddenly began to transform into phone calls from a collection agency. I don't know how that worked. I'm pretty convinced that that guy has the worst job on the planet. I mean, his job is to like go and make people's lives miserable and threaten them until they give them some money. And I was trying to like picture that in the morning when he like leaves for work. What is the stuff? <laughs> Good luck, honey. Have fun intimidating people. Or I hope you get lots of money from people who are scared of you today. It just, it, it's just not a, it's not a good spot for him, not a good spot for me. But by the time I was um, 19, I was in a world of hurt. I had a ton of debt. I had no clue what I could do with it. And um, I stopped answering the phone calls, and that didn't actually help it either. And then one Christmas, my grandfather, um, out of the blue, sent me a check that covered it. And it was, it was an incredible lifting of weight. It was, it was such a relief. I could finally pick up the phone when it rang and tell the guy, yeah, I can give this to you. And, and it seemed like all my possibilities opened up instead of feeling like, man, how am I gonna pay for these bills on a McDonald's salary? I was suddenly able to go, hey, maybe I could go to college. Maybe I could go to school and, and without my grandfather stepping in. I don't know if I'd be a pastor today. Um, today we're looking at the phrase, um, forgive us our debts we forgive our debtors. Um, and I, I did a Greek word study to try to get at this word uh, debts and debtors. Um, in the Greek, it literally means to owe somebody something. So that wasn't real enlightening. There was no uh, great fine there, but it's literally a financial term. And so uh, we need to consider what debt is as we get into that and the feeling of being in debt. Um, have you ever been in debt? No? Believe me. Okay. No. <laughs> But right at the heart of this phrase is also the heart of the Lord's Prayer, and it's the heart of Christianity. It is what has God done for us that we couldn't do for ourselves, and that is the good news. So I want to remind us of what that good news is. Um, and basically, it works like this. God gives us everything that we have. He gave us our life. He provides for us. He gives us our capacities, and um, in return, we are to live according to his will. And then we have paradise, if that works out. Um, unfortunately, we're not so good at keeping up our end of the bargain, but God's very good at keeping up his part of the bargain. And so, um, every time that we choose to live according to our own purposes, every time that we live for ourselves rather than for God, um, each selfish moment kind of puts us in debt. Um, we take credit for things that God gave us abilities to do and never give him a second thought. And then we're a little bit more in debt. Um, I get sick, I go to the ER, they fix me up. Um, I praise the doctors for their part in it until I get the bill and then I'm not happy with the doctors anymore. But at any, no point along the way did God get the credit for putting me back together again. Um, when we think or speak poorly about another human <coughs> being, we are disrespecting one of God's kids. Um, and that's why racism is so brutal. It, it, it strips somebody of, of their dignity and, and the fact that they were made in the image of God based on nothing, really, um, on the color of their skin. Or the one that I've been thinking about a lot lately and trying to grapple with. Um, I live in a world, in a, in a system where, for whatever reason, I was born in a country that has a lot. And so this whole world system is sort of built on I can live a life of luxury as long as somebody else gets exploited at another spot. Um, at what point did I play a voluntary role in that exploitation? 
um, and the debts keep adding up. But I make some deposits too, as do you. You're here, you just worship God for a half an hour, I count that as a deposit. Our debts, our debts are piling up, but we did make a deposit, so that's good. We went to church. Um, I'm going to compliment my spouse. I'm going to try and do it, not just on Wednesday, though. I know that's Valentine's Day. But if I compliment her on Tuesday, maybe that's like doing the right thing. And, and so that might add a little uh, benefit. Um, but I can't seem to catch up at any point. Because um, God owns every minute of my life. My, I was created for one purpose. And when we live in this purpose, it is, it is a beautiful thing. It is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love one another um, as ourselves. That that when we do that, man, beautiful things burst forth. But I wouldn't say that it's the normal pattern of the world. It's not the normal pattern even of me. And so I find myself in debt. And there's a part of me that wants to go, well, God, that's that's not fair. I'm I'm doing better than most people. But then again, that's not really how debt works, is it? It's not like, oh, well, I'm in less debt than that guy, so I'm good, right? Uh, it's not, that's not it. Or what about, like, God, it seems like you should judge on a curve. Except that's not how that works either. Um, for God to be fair and for just and to be right, um, the account needs to reconcile. It has to hit zero. And so... Um, we end up wishing for something that's not fair at all, which is to God just to ignore some things. I had a, a little battle with my niece this week um, where she, she, she pulled out the line of, it's not fair. And I said, oh dear, <laughs> you do not want fair at all. And I'm reminded that uh, in the moments where we feel like it's not fair that we're in debt to God, we really don't want God to work out what's fair with us. That would be a terrifying day. And so, um, we're in this spot. By the way, when I uh, would go to the doctor for my jaw and it would just be dislocated, I would, I would always ask him, how can I stop this from happening? Like, this is a serious problem. I can't come in here every six months, have my jaw put back in by you guys and get another set of bills. So what can I do to stop this? And his answer to me was brilliant. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's why they went to school for like a bajillion years. It was, don't yawn. <laughs> and I suggest not eating apples. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to figure out how to not yawn. Another doctor suggested I could get my, my jaw wired shut <laughs> so I could talk like this for the rest of my life and be on a liquid diet and then I wouldn't have this problem. That seemed to actually uh, be a worse solution than the problem itself. And I think similarly, I find myself in the spot where, because of the fact that I live in a broken world, because I choose brokenness at times, um, because we're caught up in a system where there is brokenness all around us, it is virtually impossible for us not to end up in the spot where we need some help with sin. Every single one of us. Um, do any of you know what the Babylon Bee is? It's a little news feed. It's, it's not even news, really. It's satire. Um, and it's all religious satire. It cracks me up because it's all like churchy, churchy jokes. And they, they make up these um, fake news stories, not like the, the political fake news stories because they're not even putting them off as real. But they're just satire. And literally the day I was starting on this sermon, uh, I want to put up the, uh, the news that I saw. God decides to cut all toxic people out of his life. 7.5 billion people dead. Apparently God had been reading some self-help material and said, you know, anyone who's really uh, taking from me uh, instead of giving to me, I just need to cut out of my life to be a healthy individual. And so, 7.5 billion dead. Um, thankfully, that is a joke, and that's not how God deals with it. But basically, that is what um, Romans 6.23 says. Uh, here's the scripture for you. Um, we're putting it up on the screen so we all can read. Uh, for the wages of sin is death. That if God called the accounts and said, let's get everything in the clear right now. The wages of sin is death. And then the good news. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. 
In other words, God doesn't ignore debt. He can't. He's just. He's righteous. But instead, what he does is he says, I will handle the debt myself. Um, he accepts Christ's payment on our behalf, and then he makes us his children. He adds us to his never-ending account. We are always in the plus once we accept grace. And that's what grace is. God's saying, I could hold it against you, but instead, I'm putting you in my family. So now you get an inheritance instead. Um, and the way we lay hold of that is through faith. Um, Romans 4 or 5. Put that up for me, Mom. However, to the one who does not work, the one who doesn't try to like figure out how to match an account with God, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith will be credited to them as righteousness. Righteousness given to us to clear the account. And then Galatians 3.13, Mom. You would? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. God received the collector's call himself. And then he adds us to his family. And we inherit righteousness. When my debt got paid when I was 19, um, and the collectors that were hounding me just stopped, uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. I can't, I can't even tell you the relief, because I had no clue what I was going to do. I was trapped. I had no way out. And what happens is even better when we come and we give ourselves to Christ is instead of just being trapped and brought back to zero, we get life added to us. Um, Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19 says this, Therefore, if any one is in Christ, new creations come. The old is gone. Something new has happened. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. And he's committed to us this message of reconciliation. That's the good news. We get to go tell people, hey, God wants to add you to his family, take away all of your debts, set you free. It's incredibly good news. And what do you say when you get a check like that that clears your debt? What do you, what do you say when you get an unexpected present that, that is absolutely going to change your life? It's really, really hard to respond. It's happened a couple times in my life. Um, I remember being in Bible school and thinking, I'm going to get kicked out because I, I can't pay this. And right then, somebody told me that there was a scholarship for people who were looking at being a pastor. And it would cover the rest of my quarter so I didn't have to stop going to school. And what do I write in a letter to this lady who made this scholarship? Wow. Thanks. I will do everything I can to live this out faithfully, the purpose that you put this here. And that's what we do with God. We sit there and we go, God, grace. I'm going to do everything I can to live a life worthy of what you've given me. I can't pay you back. There's not a chance. But I'll give you everything I got. Which brings us to the second part of this um, phrase in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's one of the most terrifying and challenging <laughs> parts of this prayer that I know. Um, Just as we seem to uh, be unable to stay away from debt ourselves, um, when we sin, we usually affect somebody else. And there are very few sins that I can think of that only affect the person. Um, it trickles down. And the reality is, if we're going to be in the same space, we're going to step on each other's toes. And all through this life, people have stepped on your toes, and they owe you for that. Uh, you are owed something, and, and you probably know what it is. Maybe somebody owes you an apology, and they just never gave it. Maybe they owe you a fresh start. Maybe they owe you some time of your life um, back. Maybe they owed you a better childhood, or um, a safer workplace, or, or a home where you could let your guard down. 
and they owe us, and they've been they've been reaching into our our bank account of happiness that God gave us and just taking. So just as solving um, our debt leads to eternal life, how we handle other people's debt towards us greatly will affect our life. It will be the question of whether or not we live fully or not. And I love the fact that the Bible in general, and especially the Lord's Prayer, it's not idealistic. Last week we talked about, give us this day our daily bread. It does not assume that you're always going to feel like you have an overabundance. This week it says... I'm going to assume that you're going to get wronged through your life. This is not a, a some pie in the sky, rosy colored glasses of a perfect world utopia. Um, it has in there, you're going to get wronged. So the question is, how are we going to deal with it? I want you to know, first off, that this verse is not saying uh, God is only going to forgive you as much as you forgive somebody else. Um, it looks like that. But that would put um, the level of grace at our level, and we need God to do for us what we cannot. Uh, Ephesians 2 I just want to remind you of the scripture. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Um, if we made it as much as I forgive other people, that's how much I can be forgiven of, then we're back working again. And that's not what God does, He gives us a gift. That said, I think this prayer does describe what the experience of grace is. I don't think unless we know how to extend grace and forgiveness to other people, we're able to fully appreciate the forgiveness that we get from God. Um, it's like it's there and we believe it, but it never really sinks in. Um, it's just sort of an intellectual process. We go, oh good, I'm forgiven. But we don't really know what it takes to forgive because we've never done it. But when we forgive people, we start to see what it is that God has done for us. This, um, this prayer reminded me of, of a scripture that I love, and it's, it's a story. I love Jesus' story. It's Matthew 18, um, 23 through 35. I'm going to read it for us. Um, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants, and he began to sell them. And a man owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees and said, Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, let him go. Grace. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. And he grabbed him and he began to choke him. And he said, Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I'll pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off. He had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. And they went and they told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in, You wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I am you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all of the owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. It's a challenging word. Um, this week I got in a, a, a battle with my niece. Um, a lot of people had done a lot of things for her in regards to her dog, and then um, she's going to be giving the dog back to its former owner, but it didn't happen on the time scale that we initially thought, and she wanted to charge them for having to watch the dog until they were ready for it. And it was just the tiniest little thing after how much has been done for her, and I, I, I was so mad. And I, I, I brought up this scripture in my head, and I said, look what she was doing, she was just like that servant. And then I went down to California this week, and Christina and I had uh, a fantastic date on Friday, like reliving one of our favorite dates of our entire marriage, and I was walking around Disneyland. I was in the happiest place on earth, especially when there's not lines, by the way. It's a, it's a fairly happy place. And I was walking around just fuming. 
My niece was this ungrateful servant. And then it occurred to me, God had forgiven me of much. And here I was holding this little thing that my 18-year-old niece did against her for multiple days. And all it was doing was making me miserable. As I was um, researching for the sermon, I read uh, a sermon about uh, that was given actually in a prison context about this, about resentment. And the guy was talking about how uh, when we resent somebody, we put them in our own personal jail. But the problem is that we end up having to stand guard for it. And uh, one of the coolest things happened in this particular uh, sermon because uh, one of the prisoners talked about how it's actually easier to be a prisoner than it is to be a guard. Prisoner is in an 8 by 10 foot or a 10 by 12 foot cell. Like 100 square feet, basically. The guard is sitting in a 4 by 6 foot guard room looking at screens. The prisoner is um, relaxed. He's just trying to find ways to pass the time. Uh, I actually knew a guy who came to faith uh, from being in jail for six months and he read the whole Bible. Apparently, you can get a lot of reading done when there's absolutely nothing else be done. Um, but the guard is sitting there, staring at the screens, making sure nothing's going wrong. He's alert. He's dialed in. Um, and you may think the only benefit is really, uh, that guy gets to go home to freedom, whereas the guard or the prisoner doesn't. But um, when we resent somebody, we don't actually take time off. I learned that with my niece this week. Um, <coughs> Have you ever noticed how there's some people who, in their faith, they just, um, they seem to be on fire. There's like a lightness to the way that they live. They don't carry around a whole lot of burdens. They don't seem weighed down and heavy. And I think it's because of something like this. They've learned to travel light. They knew what it was to have the burden of their sin lifted off their shoulders and the freedom that comes with having possibilities and to live fully alive. And then they decided to extend that to other people too. So they're not walking around with new luggage every day that they pick up from somebody. I had a rough time with my stepmom when I when I was a teenager, and um, I held that for years. My stepmom was over it; she wasn't carrying around luggage anymore. But uh, at 21, I had a good friend who helped talk me through what it meant to forgive this person. Um, and I gradually found that I was dropping the luggage. When I was at the airport about to fly back home, um, I saw this couple, and they were at the counter, and um, you could kind of see what happened. They had their luggage all open right next to the counter, and they were, like, moving things from one bag to another. They were trying to find, like, the cardboard boxes that they could take off of items and wrap them in clothes in order to lighten the weight, and... Uh, and they hadn't made it onto the scale. They were going to have to pay an extra charge for having to carry the weight. And then it occurred to me, like, even if they get that scale working out, they're still lugging around a 50-pound bag. Have you ever lugged around a 50-pound bag on a trip? Oof, it's not fun. Um, I did it. Christina and I didn't really know how to travel well for a long period of time. And I was lugging around a 50-pound bag everywhere that I went. And I was on a train and I met this couple from Australia. And I had asked them uh, how long they'd been traveling. And they said they were traveling for two months. And I said, oh, are you guys staying in the town that we're going to? Assuming that's where their luggage had been. And they said, oh, no, we're just passing through. And I said, what? So that backpack you're wearing, that's all you have to carry around. And they go, yeah, well, that, that's, that's how we travel. We do this every year for three months. Still trying to figure out how they did it. But I'd like to learn because traveling light is a beautiful thing. I know people who travel light and I want to be a person who travels light. When we extend forgiveness to folks, we get to experience what it is to travel light. I'm going to close with one thing. Uh, what we're asking God when we say forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors is we're actually asking God to treat us just like we treat somebody else. It's a bold prayer, man. 
Um, let me put it in another way. So uh, imagine that you have a neighbor whose trash keeps flying into your yard, right? They just, they don't put the lid on their garbage can. It flies off, it gets in your yard. Every week you tell the guy, come on, man, put your garbage lid on, right? So that I don't have to pick up your garbage every week. Every week he doesn't do it. You keep picking up his garbage. Then one day you figure out a way to get him back. You set a trap. I'm pretty sure he won't see it coming. You invite him over for dinner. Just a friendly neighbor. Come on over for dinner. Uh, he doesn't see it coming. He accepts your dinner invitation. So you go to the store and instead of buying juicy steaks and mashed potatoes and chocolate cake, you buy all the things that you think will absolutely just make a horrible dinner for him. Sardines, unlike multiple day old bread where it's so hard you can barely bite through it, uh, that'll be the appetizer. You find some bruised tomatoes and some, some lettuce that's really about to go. And you figure that'll make a nice salad for him. Uh, you buy a couple TV dinners because they have Salisbury steak in them, which is absolutely horrid. And you can give them that as the main course. And then you remember that way back in your cupboard, you have some Girl Scout cookies that are like three years old. No clue how they're going to be. But that could be a solid dessert for this uh, neighbor that you're really frustrated with. Uh, you prepare it all, he comes over for dinner, and as soon as he sees what's being served, he goes, yeah, you know, something came up, I gotta go back home, I'm gonna order a pizza, I think, uh, but I really gotta talk to my family right now, I'm sorry I can't make your dinner party. But you've already gone to the store, guess what you're eating that night? Forgive us our sins as a reminder that how we treat others will be how we experience life. If we want peace, let's extend peace to people whether they deserve it or not. If we want kindness and generosity, let's extend kindness and generosity whether they deserve it or not. And the reason we can do this is because God has given us infinitely more than we will ever give to somebody else. So let's just follow his pattern and find life, find life abundant. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life to the full. And even though it seems counterintuitive to forgive somebody who doesn't deserve it, it's really God trying to give us life back. He gave it to us um, by taking on our debt. And he gives it to us when we agree to not hold that against us. Let's pray. God, thank you for the gift of grace. It's the only thing in the world, grace and love, that can stop enemies from retaliating because enough is never enough. God, thanks for a better path than revenge and holding things against people. Thank you for forgiving us of a debt we could never have managed and for giving us opportunity and strength when we needed to forgive others so that we can walk in freedom. God, we love you.